I've always been fascinated by how video games look. Not necessarily in the graphics department though. Yes, something like God of War has some of the best looking character models I've ever seen, and playing the new Modern Warfare at 120 FPS with ray tracing switched on was a real treat, but I'm more interested in how the game talks to you, tells you what's up, how healthy your in-game persona is, and how much ammunition you have left in your pistol. As the years have rolled on and gaming has progressed and matured, the way this information has been delivered to the player has evolved too. From form over function to function over form, from the beautifully minimal to the disgusting disgustingly messy, and to where it all began. The user interface a video game offers can make or break the whole experience. I'm Rich, welcome to What Culture Gaming, and this is the evolution of video game UI. Let's go back in time to what many consider to be the first video game, at least in a commercial sense. Pong. Two bats, a ball, and your score. This is where it all began. Tennis for Two was another title regarded as the first video game, similar in gameplay to Pong, yet when it comes to UI, it had nothing. Older video games were more conceptual than anything, experimental machines produced to explore the concept of video entertainment, not as something to try and break the top 10 of a leaderboard with. So a UI of any capacity wasn't really necessary. However, with the success of arcade cabinets such as Pong and Computer Space, the way we treated video games completely changed, and our pockets of quarters would soon run dry. Getting a high score was your only goal, several digits to determine your place on the leaderboard once you run out of extra lives, which itself was usually a simple numerical graphic or several icons, and that's even if you had lives. Sometimes you were either alive or you had 10 very loud seconds to fumble another coin into the slot to have another try. A three digit name was all you had from there on out. If you wanted to put Pooh at the top of the leaderboard on Space Invaders, you were more than welcome to. The arcade mentality was beautifully simple. However, as video games continue to evolve, the information we needed to know increased, most notably your well being. When you're told to imagine a health meter, you probably think of one thing a bar. Doesn't matter on the colour or size, it's the most to the point means of seeing your character's health. Once the bar depletes, you're dead. Either you're back to a checkpoint or you're fishing out another 25 cents. However, various games across the decades have taken this usually simple approach and done it in their own way. It could be a numerical value up to 100 or different amounts based on your class or character stats. It could be a row of hearts, it could be something more unique, or it could be nothing. Super Mario Bros. on the NES explicitly showed values for your coins, lives, score, and remaining time, but Mario's health was depicted by his size and colour palette, with replenishments taking the form of super mushrooms, fire flowers, and the like. Sonic the Hedgehog took a semi-similar approach, with the blue blur able to sponge one hit when holding at least one ring. You didn't have a life, power, or energy meter in these early games, though these cropped up eventually as both the series aged. On a more whimsical extreme, 1983's Attic Attack on the ZX Spectrum and BBC Micro, produced by a company eventually to be known as Rare, displayed your health as an entire roast chicken, slowly being picked away to reveal the skeletal carcass beneath. The television series Nightmare took some inspiration from this. Did this health meter terrify anyone else as a kid? I know it did me. Wolfenstein 3D and Doom decided not to make a choice of form or function, and instead opted to do both, giving you a numerical value for your health, but also having the visage of your protagonist becoming bloodier by the wound. You have the choice of either taking a moment to read a number, or have a quick glance to see the state of your own face. Either worked well enough to tell you how you were doing. Something Doom more specifically did with its HUD alone was give you all the information you could have possibly needed. No menus, weapon switching, or any tinkering required. All weapons and ammo values were on screen the whole time. It wasn't something Doom invented, but it was a much more refined depiction of what we'd seen before. When PC gaming was becoming a bona fide phenomenon back in the 80s and 90s, the RPGs were the kings. Translated from the tabletop to the screen, dungeon crawling, slaying mythical beasts, and exploring lands of pure fantasy was all the rage. However, before the more modern incarnation of the RPG, with separate menus, skill trees, and usually minimalist UI, pretty much everything you needed to know was right there on the screen. There was a lot of real estate to be used, as having the sometimes 3D graphics take up the majority of the display could have been pretty taxing on even the most powerful systems at the time. Usually featuring tabs to switch between your various items, spells, loadouts, and armor, the concept of stacking menus or switching away from the main action wasn't as present until the medium matured. 
Nowadays, you're switching to a whole new display to see what knickknacks you've picked up on your quest. Or if you're wielding a weapon, you're seeing your ammunition statistics only when holding that particular weapon, unlike in Doom and Doom 2. Speaking of devices of destruction, who needs to reload? There's a number of bullets on the screen, I should be able to fire that many times before I need to pick up more, right? Well, that's the case for many 90s first-person shooters and a few modern shooters too, obligatory Doom footage here. However, not all weapons can fire from bottomless pockets, occasionally you will have to reload, so how will you know when? Back when light guns were popular in arcades and on home consoles too, the usual way to show how many rounds you had left was to show you a row of depleting bullets. Legendary shooting games such as Duck Hunt, Time Crisis and House of the Dead gave you a visual representation of the number of rounds you had left in your weapon, or even the number of rounds you had end off. As the first person shooter genre boomed, this more visual mentality did carry over somewhat. Titles such as Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare had a visual representation of the number of rounds left in your magazine, but counting up to 30 individual vertical lines proved more difficult than it needed to be, so future titles opted for a more simple numeric value. Some titles even had your ammunition value present in-game on your weapon, from Halo Combat Evolved all the way through to Apex Legends. The concept of information present to the player also being present in the real world of the game is also something developers like to do to shake up the usual formula of the heads-up display. Sometimes a video game does something different with your HUD. Either you get a little less present on your screen, or you have absolutely nothing at all. Aforementioned titles have given you your chambered ammunition count on the weapon itself, whereas some have done more to achieve less non-diegetic text floating about in your peripheral vision. As if being followed by a projector drone, Sam Fisher knows what to do in Splinter Cell Conviction since his objectives are being splayed out on his surroundings in 8-foot high letters. Other titles get away with what appears to be a bog-standard yet diegetic UI by giving the player a helmet. Though it shows everything they're used to, the character in-game can technically see it all too, taking the being in the protagonist's shoes to a whole new level. The Metroid Prime series does it, as does Star Wars Republic Commando, and rather aptly, the upcoming Iron Man VR. You could argue that any title featuring the player in a helmet does the same. Some titles incorporate your health bar into your character itself, notably Dead Space's resource integration gear or rig. Appearing as a glowing tube along your avatar's spine, it was still very much a simple health bar, but done very differently. The likes of Call of Duty do away with statistics, bars, or anything regarding your health system, albeit in a handful of modern titles. Taking damage would begin to desaturate your display and or start covering your peripheral vision in lashings of raspberry jam. Diving behind cover would slowly replenish your health, with both the jam and muffled audio clearing to give you the go-ahead to dive back into battle. But what about the times when diegetic is all there is? There's no immersion-breaking way to just plonk some text or graphics in front of the player. Virtual reality. As a new medium within video games, developers are still experimenting with how information is relayed to the player. The aforementioned Iron Man VR gets a free pass since the idea of Tony Stark's helmet having a hood beneath it means the usual display of compasses, numeric stats and the like are canonically present. But what about when titles don't have that luxury? You may get some floating text accompanying your weapon like in Fallout 4 VR, or your weapon itself has a visual depiction of your rounds left, such as the pistol in Half-Life Alex. Health may be depicted by a slowly reddening screen or some kind of hand-mounted health bar. Or the game could give you nothing. Superhot VR is a one-hit kill, and you only know how many rounds you don't have left when the weapon goes click. When having no HUD at all is just a little too little, the next thing developers think about is how to present it. In the early days, the typeface within the sprite sheet of a game cartridge or arcade machine was usually all there was to play with, but as the media matured, the user interface was given much more flair. The aesthetics of the title you're playing would bleed into the design of the UI. Are you playing a horror title? There's a good chance your UI might look a little dishevelled and splattered with dry blood. Playing a futuristic shooter? Expect lots of neon and digital typefaces. This theme of keeping the HUD design within the house style of the title was heavily prominent throughout the late 90s and 2000s, with it starting to fade away as titles matured further. Though titles such as Call of Duty Black Ops 4 may attempt to have a fitting HUD for its zombies mode, which it has done for the last handful of titles, Black Ops 4 specifically was boisterous, messy, and just downright ugly. On the flip side, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order went for a much more hyper-minimal approach, not as in keeping to the Star Wars aesthetic we've been used to in previous titles set in a galaxy far, far away. Minimalism in the UI space can make a title more cinematic. Explosive Racer Split Second opted for a minimal HUD, while keeping it front and centre as not to distract you too much from a toppling building. 
But before you've even had the chance to grab your first coin, load your weapon or even put your seatbelt on, you're actually wanting to start the game itself. Where do you always begin? The main menu, provided the game doesn't just throw you in the deep end as soon as you put the disc in. Sometimes the menu need be nothing more than start, options and quit. You may get a hyper simplified title screen reminiscent of those from the NES era, or you'll have something fully rendered that could even act as the first shot of the game, looking at you, God of War. As console gaming became a lot more popular over the years, menus were built with controllers in mind, simplified buttons with sub-menus available rather than just dumping everything on one screen, making traversal harder with a thumbstick. A mouse is always quicker and more accurate than a controller in multiple ways, and this even led to the mainstream menu, be it to simply start the game or rummage through your inventory, bringing back the use of a cursor, even on a console. Bungie's Destiny spearheaded a cursor traversed menu in modern games, with the influence being felt through everything from Call of Duty to Dead by Daylight. Why even have a menu remove you from the gameplay entirely? Have it appear around you in the division, or as a translucent panel ahead of you in Dead Space? You could also be wearing the bulk of your menus on your wrist in the Fallout series, or most of it could lie within your backpack in The Last of Us. Video games have come a long way, from not needing to tell you much about what you're doing to giving you a quasi-encyclopedia to read within the options menu, to this day, developers are experimenting with ways to convey information to the player in the prettiest, most effective, or least distracting ways possible, or even trying to achieve all three at the same time. The amount of information we've needed from the games we're playing has evolved over time too. First, we needed to only know scores. Now we're needing to know how much HP a particular enemy has left, the weak spots we need to hit in order to take it down, and all of that within a time frame we need to be informed of too. It's a balancing act within development that has entire teams of programmers, artists, and directors all working to ensure an experience that we almost don't realise is happening. Here's to you, the UI and UX designers. You are the people putting the proverbial cherry atop a fantastic game. Or you could be souring the whole experience with iffy design decisions and a horrible typeface to boot. What examples of video game UI do you admire, and which video games do you think have the worst looking hood of them all? Black Ops 4 Zombies, I am looking at you. Don't forget to subscribe to What Culture Gaming here on YouTube if you haven't already, and please let me know in the comments if you want to see more editorial style stuff like this. You can either tell me down below or you can go and shout at me on Twitter at PickupChangeToe. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you soon.